So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for the first in a new series of UK events coming from the British School at Rome. My name is Bryony Smith and I'm part of the BSR London office. And it's my pleasure to introduce this new series of events which will showcase the ongoing work of our alumni in the UK, celebrate our partners and our partnerships throughout the country and present a forum for debate on issues facing the arts, humanities and social sciences in the UK today. Obviously, for obvious reasons, uh, all of the events coming from the BSR at the moment are online. And the intention is that this new UK programme will complement the events coming from Rome on a regular basis. Um, but as soon as we're able to, we will start to run in-person events again from our base in London and also with partner venues across the country. Um, we'll still continue to make these events available online though for all of our friends in Rome and everybody else around the world who's tuning in. So please do stay in touch with us um, and further updates on this programme by joining our mailing list and following us on social media and checking our website uh, on the events page. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague who is speaking to us from Rome, Harriet O'Neill, who is the BSR's Assistant Director for the Humanities, Social, and Humanities and Social Sciences. Harriet has very kindly agreed to appear as chair for this evening's event, and she's going to introduce uh, this evening's speakers to you all. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Harriet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bryony. Um, it's lovely to see you and our speakers, and thank you very much to our audience for joining us. So just to remind our audience, the title of tonight's event is Shifting the Narrative, Challenging Perceptions of, the, of Renaissance and Baroque Histories. And um, we're delighted that we have two wonderful speakers um, joining us tonight, Catherine Fletcher and Letizia Treves. Um, who are going to both um, show PowerPoint and then um, have a conversation and then we'll invite the audience to send in their questions using the Q&A function and if the questions look particularly pertinent to that part of the discussion then we will um, uh, read them aloud and um, we'll see how the conversation goes so we have an hour um, and it should be um, really interesting and illuminating but to give you a sense of our speakers and where they come from, Catherine Fletcher is a historian of Renaissance and early modern Europe and professor of history at Manchester Metropolitan University. She's also author of The Black Prince of Florence, The Spectacular and Treacherous World of Alessandro de' Medici, which is a biography of Duke Alessandro de' Medici, and Our Man in Rome, Henry VIII and his Italian Ambassadors, which is about the diplomacy behind the divorce of Henry VIII. The paperback edition of her most recent book, which is what we're going to hear about tonight, The Beauty and the Terror, An Alternative History of the Italian Renaissance, is published this month by Vintage. And we're very excited to be able to, um, to, to share, um, though you may already know, that it's been long listed for the Royal Society of Literature's on Darcy Prize. Catherine has also worked as a TV researcher and producer and was advisor on the BBC adapt adaptation of Wolf Hall. Uh, importantly, and we're so grateful, Catherine was a Rome Fellow at the BSR between 2009 and 2010 and has been in Rome fairly recently talking about her new HRC project. So we're delighted to welcome her back and thank you so much for um, giving your time. And we also have, um, I'm so pleased to see Letizia Trevers, who is the James and Sarah Sassoon curator of later Italian, Spanish and French 17th century paintings at the National Gallery. Uh, she joined the National Gallery in 2013, following a career in the Old Master Paintings Department at Sotheby's, where she was Senior Director and the Principal Worldwide Specialist in Italian Painting. Uh, you may know her work um, a as a curator at the National Gallery through a number of exhibitions, notably Beyond Caravaggio, which was 2016, and Murillo, The Self-Portrait, in 2018. In 2018, um, Letizia championed the National Gallery's acquisition of Artemisia Gentileschi's self-portrait of St. Catherine of Alexandria, the first painting by the artist to enter a public collection in the UK. And tonight she's going to talk to us about the much acclaimed Artemisia exhibition, which opened at the National Gallery last year. So I am now going to um, thank both speakers and hand you over, Catherine, for a sort of five minute uh, sharing of your screen and to discuss your book and open up some of the issues that we're going to talk about tonight, which are about kind of opening up new histories and ways of thinking about the Renaissance and Baroque and also connecting with audiences. So thank you both. 
Well, thank you very much for the um, introduction, Harriet. Let me just um, show you this um, screen. You should be able to see the cover of the book, um, The Beauty and the Terror, An Alternative History of the Italian Renaissance. Um, there's a little kind of <laughs> backstory here to book titles, which is that um, particularly when you're trying to sell books in bookshops, you don't always get to pick your own. And this book went through multiple iterations of titles before it ended up being an alternative history of the Italian Renaissance. Um, but that wasn't where it started. It started very much as an idea um, that I would write a book about the Italian wars. Um, the wars that went on in Italy between 1494 and 1559 and their impact on society. Um, and that was the first thing that I was going to do. And as the project, and, and I was interested in the impact of the wars on all sorts of other things that were going on at the time, um, on the artistic life of Italy in that period. I was interested in the relationship to religious change and particularly the impact on the Catholic Church in relation to the Reformation. I was sort of interested in how they spilled out into the wider world beyond the Italian peninsula, because this is a period when Italy is really the theatre of a European war and actually a war that goes um, beyond Europe into the Mediterranean, involves the Ottoman Empire and latterly involves a Spain um, that is running its own imperial projects as well um, in the New World, for example. So I began with this idea of writing about the Italian wars and I ended up with this book that really became an attempt to knit together four different stories um, that impact on the Italian peninsula in the 16th century in different ways. One, the artistic change, two, the religious change, three, the wars, and four, those world projects. And I start in 1492 because it's the famous year of Columbus, <clears throat> but also it's the year of the death of Lorenzo de' Medici, the year in which Rodrigo Borgia is elected Pope, and the year in which the Jews are expelled from Spain and um, there are various stories kind of interwoven of Jewish life um, as well as the lives of, of other minorities in um, 16th century Italy along the way. Um, so it, part of it emerged from sort of my frustration of the fact that a lot of the time in history these narratives get siloed and we tell one of them at a time and we don't tell all of them. So you take your tour around an art gallery, you see the artistic side, you get some context, but the context is there to inform you about the background, the art that you're seeing. Um, if you get a book about the reformations, it tells you that bit of the story. You get a book about warfare, it tells you that bit of the story. So I was trying to put them together. And as I started doing this, I became very, very conscious of just how many links and ties that you can find. So if you take um, Michelangelo here, obviously he is best known for the artistic work, of course, um, but he in Florence paints propaganda paintings, um, the Battle of Cascina um, in, the, um, in the Palazzo della Signoria, the Palazzo Vecchio, um, to sort of inspire the Florentine authorities as they're debating what's going on in the wars. Um, he's engaged in religious reform discussions with people like Vittoria Colonna, and um, they talk about this book, which is one of the key texts of um, Italian reform Catholicism, The Benefit of Christ Crucified. Um, we see um, Vittoria Colonna, that the book takes us on to, to, to Colonna's role within those circles of the spirituali. Um, Colonna in turn links us into the world of other um, female writers and artists like um, Sophonisba and Guisola. Um, here, one of her very early portraits, um, one of the very, very, very significant um, 16th century women artists. And I'm going to talk a bit, a bit more later on about um, women in the arts in this period, but I'll just show you that rather um, lovely um, portrait of the young Marquis Massimiliano Stamper um, from the 1550s. Um, and not only do we have connections between art and religious reform, we also have connections um, between art and war. Um, I'll show you this gun. Um, guns are a new technology in this period. They're something that I write about in relation to warfare um, in the book. 
But um, this is a wheel lock gun, um, a new and dangerous type of gun, which could be concealed um, beneath your cloak and therefore was regarded as a handy weapon for um, assassins and bandits. There's a gun rather like this that appears in a portrait of the Emperor Charles V um, by Titian. And Leonardo da Vinci made a sketch of the wheel lock mechanism that goes inside. So again, a kind of direct connection between um, the mechanisms of war and the artistic outputs of the period. Final um, picture from me, because I'm conscious of time. Um, this is, I'm not sure how well this will show up on your screen um, because, the, the, because of the way the coloration works in the, in the photograph, but um, this is a portrait of a man in armor with two pages, um, one white page and one black page. And I put it up there partly for the, um, the connection back to war, but also because it brings to mind um, the um, issue of the colonial projects in which many Italian leading families are involved. The fact that Isabella, Isabella d'Este, who's a major um, art collector of this period, was also engaged in the purchase of enslaved black children at this time. And that when we start to look at the, um, the history of slavery, we see practically everybody who was anybody in um, late 15th and early 16th century Italy turning up, including um, the Medici family, um, obviously Christopher Columbus, but also Mona Lisa's husband, who was a slaveholder. Um, so that just tries to give you very, very brief whistle-stop tour of some of the issues that um, turn up in the book. It's obviously not new to talk about tyranny and terror in the Renaissance. Um, you go back to Burkhardt, he's doing it in the 19th century. But I think um, what I've tried to do in, in this book is to bring together some of the newest scholarship on that variety of issues. Um, with the material that's more familiar and hopefully to make that accessible to the to the kind of tourist or casual reader who wants to know how the backstory to the art that they might be looking at in a gallery um, played out. Thank you very much, Catherine. That was <laughs> very um, impressive um, compression of so many ideas in your book. Um, I will now pass over to Letizia and then we can start um, exploring some of those connections and ideas. So I'll mute myself. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to talk very briefly about the exhibition that was held last year. It, it eventually opened in October. It was due to open in April last year, but was delayed due to obviously the pandemic. Um, and really the exhibition arose out of this picture, and this is the acquisition of this picture by the National Gallery in 2018. Um, the picture is a very new discovery. It was only discovered in France at the end of 2017. Um, so really the exhibition was the first chance we had to really put this picture beside other paintings by Artemisia. And for me, this was one of the great highlights of the exhibition uh, and something that clearly no one had seen before because the picture had only just uh, being found and being discovered. Um, so that's how the sort of exhibition came about. It was the first exhibition dedicated to Artemisia in this country. And as, as Harriet said, our painting, the self-portrait of St. Catherine is the first picture in a public collection. And it is astonishing, but, but Artemisia was incredibly successful in her own lifetime, but was really forgotten for centuries and was only really rediscovered in the 1970s, um, really by, by feminist art historians who um, you know, forefronted not only her pictures, but, um, you know, her life story as well. And I think what I wanted to slightly challenge in this exhibition and what I wanted to do differently from previous shows was um, to, to sort of present a more, more balanced view, a more rounded view of Artemisia, because in the past, certain elements of her story, of her biography, and I'm referring, of course, to her rape as a young woman. Um, I think these have sort of obscured discussions about her pictures, about her artistic achievements, and also the, the, the sort of market she created for her pictures. I mean, I was very keen to kind of bring out this idea of her sort of commerciality. I mean, that's not a bad thing. I think as an artist, you know, you definitely are um, trying to expand your client base and run a workshop. And this side of her work hadn't really been looked at 
properly before. Uh, and she was extremely resourceful. Um, and I think for Artemisia, you really can't separate her, her life or her gender from her art. So as you can see from the foyer, you know, before you even go into the exhibition, it's very clear you're going to see an exhibition of, 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 of a, a woman artist. And the other thing that I really wanted to do was to give Artemisia her voice again. And so in fact, her quotes from her own letters appear throughout the show. Um, and some of them are, you know, very bold feminist statements about, you know, how she regarded herself and how she wanted to be um, seen on a par with male artists of the time. And I felt that was a very important thing to bring in to the story and really show Artemisia in the round. I, I wanted to tell the story as simply and as straightforwardly as possible. So I really was very selective. There were only about 30 paintings. I really chose the best pictures. I didn't really want um, pictures where attributions would be questioned. Um, this was really showing about showing her at her best. And, and I felt it was simpler to tell her story in a sort of chronological way as well through the pictures. So it began here in this very powerful first room with her first known painting, the Susanna and the Elders on the left, which she paints when she's just 17. Um, and opposite a picture by her father, Orazio Gentileschi, who trained her. And in the middle was this amazing transcript of the rape trial, which is referred to in a lot of literature concerning Artemisia but which had never been seen in public before. And I felt this was a very important, and I'm sure we'll come back to this later. Obviously it's a very important part of her story, but I didn't want to sort of sensationalize it. So I thought by borrowing the transcript, it gave a real kind of historical weight to it. Um, it is a legal document ultimately. Um, and also people were able to read Artemisia's own words. So it sort of really made it a very sort of vivid way of, of, of conveying that part of her story. This is the picture of Orazio's painting and through the doorway, uh, Artemisia picking up on the same subject and composition a few years later. Um, of course, the exhibition included some of her most famous works. These are her two renditions of Judith beheading Holofernes, again, a great highlight of the show. But as I say, there were also some new things, you know, our pictures there nestled alongside other pictures she painted in Florence and this run of self portraits. Um, you know, was was really enlightening as well. I mean, particularly in terms of self-portraiture, you know, it's been said that over half her pictures contain portraits of herself. I personally don't think that's the case. Um, and I felt it was quite important to sort of establish true self-portraits and then through the doorway, there's actually a portrait of her by a French painter, Simon Vouet. Um, and then her letters really brought this to life, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in a while as well. Uh, the letters you see in here, these, these were discovered in the Fresco Baldi archives in 2011 by Francesco Solinas. And these are extraordinary because these are personal letters that she writes to her lover in Florence when she's just moved back to Rome. And they really give you such a great sense of her as a person, her character. Um, you know, of course, they're not like letters written to patrons, so you really get a sense of, of, of her personality coming through. And some of them are tragic, some of them are witty, and some she's extremely jealous, so you get a really rounded sense of um, her sort of very passionate personality. And for me, what was very important was she comes out, um, you know, it's this sort of preconception of her as a victim, and she's not at all. She really comes out as, as an incredibly determined, uh, forceful personality. Um, and also the portraits, because we don't think of her as a portraitist, but in fact, in her own days, she was renowned as a portraitist. Um, and then a lot of her pictures obviously feature female protagonists. I know we're going to be talking about this in a while, um, but there was a room I dedicated precisely to this question, sort of interrogating a little why, um, you know, in a way, why she was so, so sought after for these sorts of subjects and how she created a market for them. And then the, the, the sort of latter half of the exhibition really covered her time in Naples where she spent 25 years and the scale of these pictures was very, very different. And I think you got a real sense of that in the spaces that there was a sort of gear change, you know, a very definite change in her style as well, where she starts to begin with collaborate, she starts to collaborate with other artists as well. Um, and then I decided to end the show in London so it's a little bit out of chronology because I wanted in a way this theatrical finale where Artemisia is put back alongside her father to show how far she'd come really um, and really just to show how the two artists aims were very very different and um, the very final picture in, in the exhibition was the great um, allegory of painting from the royal collection 
And, you know, I feel this exhibition has done, you know, we, we did a sort of survey when we were planning, well, shortly after we bought the painting in 2018, um, we did some market research, research ahead of the exhibition and very few people had heard of Artemisia. And I feel that by the end of the exhibition, you know, she's not maybe a household name, but she's certainly better known. Um, and, um, you know, I think now that you can see her, she's hanging just on the left next to Caravaggio's Supra de Mes. And I feel that the exhibition has gone some way in sort of re-establishing her in the canon. And there she is hanging now alongside these, these great masters of the Italian Baroque. So I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lizzie. It's you again for, for bringing so many of the key ideas in your exhibition and allowing us to walk through it. Um, I should say that Letizia and Catherine only met this morning um, when we had our <laughs> rehearsal, um, but the, you know, they're serendipitous uh, connections. And I just wondered whether you, either of you have a sort of gut reaction to each other's PowerPoint and some of the ideas that were percolating through, and then we can discuss specifically women before, before opening up the bigger themes of the discussion. Catherine, maybe. I mean, well, I suppose the, the, this question about the artist and the personal life, I suppose, is always one that's very that that um, is very challenging, is very interesting. I mean, one of the things um, because there's this new Leonardo TV show that has just started on Amazon. You may have seen it's had some coverage in the newspapers. Um, I've been asked, been asked to kind of go, go on and talk about Leonardo da Vinci's private life in the various podcasts and so on. And I think there is always this there could be this fascination with the human interest story about the person who made the art. And I think that, you know, all the more so with kind of celebrity culture these days, we feel a sort of that we can, that we want to, um, you know, know everything about people. And there is that temptation. And I think often with write, in writing narrative as well, to want to sort of read off from a biographical account, what's going on in person's work. But mm. then when I think about myself as a writer and what I'm writing about at any given time I mean I would not say that it personally reads off from my biography I mean of course it's like influenced by the world around me but would I want to you, you know can I draw a linear connection well most of the time no so I think that's one of the challenges in telling these stories is getting the human interest in to engage audiences but then not allowing that to sort of overwhelm the work of the people that we're talking about. Mm. I think that's very true. I think in Artemisia's case, it's so true of her most famous work, the Judith beheading Holofernes, um, of which you know, I showed you two, the two sort of versions side by side. And, you know, she sort of puts herself in her pictures because she's a woman. She understands the, the point of view of her protagonists. But I think to read every Judith as sort of a revenge in paint against her rapist is, is extremely reductive, actually. And I think mm. it really doesn't do her any favors. Actually, it goes against what we are actually trying to do, which is to bring her out as an artist in her own right. And, um, you know, I, I, I really feel reading her pictures purely in that vein is not helpful at all. Now, we talked a lot of the, before the exhibition about the importance of also addressing uh, the issue of her rape. Um, and for me, the very difficult thing was to sort of present that and give, you know, to a sort of average visitor can't possibly have a grasp on the sort of context for that. And that's where, mm -hmm. Catherine, I think your book is, is it's so brilliant at bringing in the context because these artists were influenced by wars, by plagues, by the kind of social restrictions in Artemisia's case. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I think I had many discussions with our interpretation editor um, because she said, you know, you can't just assume visitors will know that, it, you know, women of Artemisia's social status weren't educated. So mm. the fact that she she didn't know how to read and write. So when she goes to Florence, she teaches herself to read and write. And then having the letters in the exhibition full of errors and written incredibly badly and full of phonetic spellings, it's, it's, it's all the more touching because she taught herself to read and write. So I think the life goes hand in hand with the art, but, but you're right, there's this real risk of it sort of taking over. And I think at the museum in the past, there have been sort of two camps, one where the biography is completely taken over. And then there was a sort of, wave against that 20 years ago purely looking at pictures in a kind of art historical way and I think then one can risk also moving too far away and I think I sort of tried to take a kind of more middle road I suppose. <laughs> mm. Yeah I think um, 
Catherine, are you still with us? Um, it's, uh, I think your screen might have frozen, Catherine. Um, but we shall, if Catherine is still there, <laughs> um, <laughs> we can get back to, um, to her. Catherine, are you still there? Can I ask Brownie just to make sure that Catherine is, <laughs> that we have Catherine for this <laughs> important point that Letizia has just made? Um, but we won't panic. Um, because actually following on from that, Letizia, well, we have the, we have a question related, to, ah, I think Catherine might. Try um, to get back. No, she's logging back on again. So um, we had a question actually relating to, to the rape trial um, mm. already. So it might be something while Catherine is, is logging on, mm. but if she's a, in, uh, the question says, um, but was the Artemisia rape trial really about rape or more about Artemisia being almost unmarriageable after being deflowered? And what can Catherine add, <laughs> we wait for her to come back, about the different perceptions of rape and other sexual crimes in Renaissance Italy? Yeah, so that, I mean, that was a very difficult thing um, because we, we were very careful in the wording in the exhibition calling it her deflowering mm -hmm. and it's absolutely a question of honour um, and the, the perception that uh, what rape means today is very different from what it meant then and so mm -hmm. you, you do have to contextualise that for visitors and um, even the page we opened the trial to was the page part in the trial where Artemisia is tortured, she agrees to undergo judicial torture mm. to basically prove she's telling the truth. But, you know, it seems horrifying to modern audiences that the rape victim ends up being tortured in front mm. of the rapist. And it was a very important thing to try and explain to people that this was the norm. And actually, her mode of torture was very light by comparison to what happened to most people. But it also mm. was the fact that she had no choice. She had to agree to be tortured so that she would be believed and that she knew that within the sort of, um, you know, the society in which she lived, um, it was the only way that she was basically going to, 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 to you know, get Tassi condemned for what he'd done. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's difficult issues to bring in through the exhibition. I want to see whether Catherine has returned so that she can pick up on the second half of the question and we we Sorry, uh, she's just on her way back in her internet dropped but she should okay. be back in a second okay we just pause um for the while well, she comes back in so she can ask the second part of that question and then we can talk more broadly about whether um that in terms of women artists um that their biography seems to overpower their art um would be a good place to go with the conversation so we'll just wait for Catherine. In fact, <laughs> or perhaps we should carry on. We'll just give it a few few seconds. No. <laughs> I think yeah, we've got time is precious. So um, let's hope that Catherine can rejoin us in a few minutes. But um, you're asking about um, whether you know women artists sort of their their biographies were scrutinised exactly, yeah. and whether they that yeah overshadows their work, and it, does that tend to happen more to women than to men? I mean, I think in the case of Artemisia, it's true for the reasons I sort of outlined. Mm. But um, I mean, in, in my specific area of the Baroque, I mean, obviously Caravaggio is the most famous example of someone whose mm. who's life, again, is, is very, has, has often overshadowed, you know, discussions about his art or certainly is closely intertwined with discussions about his art. Um, so I think it really depends. Um, I mean, I don't think you can entirely separate the two. No. You really don't. Um, you know, an artist's life experiences do inform their art and the production of their art. Um, but I, I wouldn't say Artemis is alone in that. There are not many other, you know, 
female, uh, you know, artist examples in my period that, that yeah. you know, one can compare them is you didn't have such sort of dramatic lives and such sort of exciting lives because she, you know, she, she, she works for the Medici, she works for Charles I. I mean, you know, she, she moves around a lot. She lives a long time as well. Mm. She's entirely self-sufficient, which isn't the case with Sophonisba or Lavinia or, you know, she, 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 she's alone for most of her life. Mm. And yeah, so uh, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of material to, to bring to those narratives. And I suppose, um, referring back to the exhibition, we could mm. think about um, the, the type, no, you, you would have come to the scholarship on Artemisia, very familiar, but through that research process, particularly seeing those letters and her handwriting, mm. What did you form any new impressions yes. of art media? Welcome back, Catherine. It's a brilliant to see you. Oh, you're sorry about that. <laughs> That's fine. No, don't worry. <laughs> maybe before maybe before we move on, we yes. can, um, we can just finish up the the, the discussion about um, about the trial. We've had a question, Catherine, mm. about the trial. Um, I don't know if you want to read it out again. Yeah, so it was a two-part question. One, um, so thank you so much because it brings in both of our speakers. One was, um, was the Artemisia rape trial really about rape or more about Artemisia being almost unmarriageable after being deflowered? And then it asks, and what can Catherine add about the different perceptions of rape and other sexual crimes in Renaissance Italy? So this really is is the, is the horror of the Renaissance that, we, that your book... Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is that the one, I mean, sexual violence is obviously widespread in our society today, and I don't want to sort of dismiss that um, in saying that, um, you know, particularly in the context of warfare, but not exclusively so, mm. there is an awful lot of sexual violence that goes on, um, rape is used as a weapon of war. Um, in the in the Italian wars, it is quite common that when you know a city is sacked or looted, that um, there is sexual violence. I mean, against women and men, in fact, um, that um, goes on in that context. And there are also an awful lot of individual cases of um, you know men being accused of rape and domestic violence. I mean, amongst the, the number of military commanders I found whose names had such allegations attached to them was quite striking. Um, and we see it as well in um, other examples of, um, of well-known well -known works of art. So Jill Burke in her book on the Renaissance nude, for example, wrote about one of the possible models for um, the Venus of Urbino, um, being a particular courtesan who was um, apparently the subject of a gang rape, a very, very mm. hideous gang rape, which was sort of designed as a, as a punishment for transgressive women, um, about which a poem was written in Venice. I mean, there is some sort of the, the, the artistic world and goes to some fairly unpleasant um, places in this period. So I think that, yeah, you know, there is a broader social context for this. Um, there is also a context for, I mean, as in Artemisia's case, as a kind of, I suppose, the question, she obviously could not um, have been made to marry her rapist because it transpired that he was already married. Um, mm -hmm. But in many cases, the solution to a rape case was for the woman to marry the man who'd done it, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, again, something that is, you know, resolves the perceived legal problem at the time of marriageability, but, you know, today feels really quite abhorrent. Thank you. Thank you for answering that question so well and so sensitively and <laughs> for coming back and um, having had your internet <laughs> fail. So we're really pleased to see you. One of the questions that um, I asked Letizia while you were um, logging back on is whether she felt that it, it was particular to women that their, when it comes to their, their paintings or their, their books, that they get overread through their bio biography. And I suppose in your writing, you, you've come across that um, instead of allowing their works and their, their literature to speak for themselves. I mean, yes, that definitely happens. Although I think there is a, there is a tendency to do it to um, what I will anachronistically call gay men, gay and bisexual men. And um, there's not being terms that would have been used in the 16th century um, but you know men so so you know going back to Freud, Freud wrote an essay about Leonardo da Vinci's mm. homosexuality 
right? Mm. So there's a kind of, and um, there's there's various discussion about Michelangelo's relationships with men. There's a kind of there there is, but but it is you know it's rather less so with the um, you know heterosexual men who are allowed to get on with it, and mm. it's the it's the women and the queer men who sort of fit, sit in in this category of oh well there's something to be explained and accounted for here mm. and we need to sort of put this this spin on it so I think yeah it, it particularly happens um, with women but there are um, situations in which I think I think you know men are subject to it too well, we're going to now, I think, go back to Artemisia and um, start thinking about perceptions of women and also under other underrepresented individuals. So I was asking Letizia, um, through her research, um, did you form new impressions, having, you know, get above the, the existing scholarship on Artemisia? And what were they? And um, were you, yeah, and in that, I know you talked about it in the, the, the beginning of your PowerPoint mm -hmm. about challenging those existing perceptions and how you found those cracks really to start to start introducing new narrative. Yeah, um, I think I think with with any exhibition, you know, until that point, I had a sort of general knowledge about the music, but it's only with working on an exhibition in a very short time frame as well. You know, effectively, I had about 17 months to put it mm. together. So I had to get on top of the literature incredibly quickly. Um, and compared to say Caravaggio, that there isn't a huge amount of literature, there's quite a lot that's come out in recent years. Um, I think I think I came to the project and to Artemisia, you know, three years ago, probably with a lot of those preconceptions, you know, about her story and um, and I think reading the letters for me was absolutely revelatory because it wasn't about reading people's interpretation of the letters. You know, I'm Italian, mm. so I read them in Italian. I wasn't reading them translated and mm. they're, they're written phonetically so that the, the language isn't particularly complex. Um, and I felt her just really come alive. So I read and reread and reread those letters mm. um, to get a real sense, to kind of get under her skin, really. Um, and it, it, I was absolutely struck by this sense. She's not particularly likable in all her letters either, but that, that's not a bad thing. You know, it makes her a more rounded personality. Mm. But, um, you know, one of the letters I borrowed for the show, she wrote after her little boy died. And she's absolutely grief stricken and it's sort of scrawled in this terrible sort of handwriting. You can feel it, you know, the way it's mm. words. But two minutes later, she's talking about, you know, my heart's broken. I'm dying of grief. And then she says, but anyway, where, my belongings, you know, she's, she's also very practical and she's, she's, you know, and so you, it's a sort of a split personality. It's, it's amazing. And for me, that made her really come alive. The other thing that I think in thinking about the show um, and thinking about what point in her life, you know, who was around her at different points, in mm. her, particularly in connection with our picture. Our picture was painted in Florence where, you know, she's in her early 20s. She's just left Rome. She's just got married or she's just been married off mm. um, and to the to the brother of her defense lawyer. So her father's defense lawyer, okay. so it's not, a, not, not a union of love. Let's put it that way. Um, and she's in Florence and she she sets up on her own and, and she's sort of got out of her father's studio and it, she's in Florence for seven years and she uses her dowry to set herself up. She buys fine clothes. She moves around the court and she, she understands that she needs to sort of meet the, the right people. And she's the first woman who um, gains membership to the Artists Academy in Florence mm -hmm. um, in 1616 and around that time she has five children in five years she is basically pregnant almost the entire time yeah. in Florence and I mean the the sort of physical but also financial pressure she must have felt mm. in those years and uh, speaking as a working mother you know I, I sort of brought my own lived experience to this exhibition but um mm. You know, that to me really, it really stayed with me, that the, the sort of financial pressure of basically being the breadwinner, but also, um, you know, having so many children in that time, just when her career is taking off. So things like that to me really, you know, became very, very sort of vivid in my mind. I also, I think with, with the sort of growth in her fame over the last sort of 20 years or so, um, with that have come sort of attributions, you know, of pictures, on the market and so on. Mm. And I think so much gets attributed to Artemisia now that I, I I have a very, I had a very kind of diluted sense of who she was as an artist and of her yeah. style. And she is a real chameleon. I mean, her style changes a lot mm. during her career because she adapts in the cities in which she works. But I think I went into it thinking she wasn't 
as great an artist as she really is. Yeah. I think in my mind, I'd sort of seen so many of these pictures come on the market and so on. And I felt bringing it back to basics and that basically borrowing the sort of the, the top pictures, the documented mm -hmm. pictures, the signed pictures, it gave me a much sort of purer sense of what a fine painter she is. So I think that for me is also very important. And that comes across, I think, really clearly in your installation shots and the ability to give the letters such prominence in a, in a painting exhibition and to have the archival information integrated into that exhibition and allowing the visitor. I suppose, did your visitors respond to those letters in the, the visitor comments and the- Very much, very yeah. much. I mean, of course, pre-COVID, the plan, we'd have the letters translated and people were gonna be able to pick up a translation in the room and obviously we weren't able to do that. So they had it sent to them digitally, you know, with their tickets, but it's not the same. Um, mm. But I think the letters, you know, also you see her handwriting and they're very legible and she has become this sort of feminist icon. So I think to go in and, and sort of read her words as they're transcribed by a scribe in the transcript as she's being tortured, where mm. she's these famous words, you know, e vero, e vero, it's true, it's true. Yeah. And then seeing her signature where her name is very legible. I mean, it really does sort of send shivers down his spine. It was really, it was a really touching thing. And I think it was an important aspect that I wanted to bring out, that sort of much more personal aspect. Mm. I think, yeah, from the installation shots, you did that very well. Um, and Catherine, I suppose, you know, you're using that sort of documentation and coming into contact mm -hmm. with that documentation in archives as well, but you've used it to, to bring to the forefront both women and other represented, unrepresented communities. And were there a group or individuals, <laughs> part of a group that you just, you wanted to, to shed light on and, and bring to the fore that hadn't already? And what surprised you about these groups when you started delving in through that archival material? Well, I think, you know, a lot of the time when we talk about the Renaissance, there's a, perhaps a dozen or so big names, right? You have your, um, you know, your Ninja Turtle artists, your kind of Michelangelo, <laughs> Leonardo and Raphael and Donatello's a little bit earlier. Um, and then you have, you have Titian, you have Machiavelli, who sort of slightly stands alone, isolated from the intellectual culture. Um, a lot mm. of the time in kind of popular representations, you have the Borgias and you have the Medici. And of course, that's a, like, like that's a tiny, tiny segment of society. Mm. And there's a whole load of other people who are living this world, who are doing the fighting of the wars for, mm. uh, you know, these people of the famous commanders who are in the artist's workshop. I mean, doing the legwork. I mean, this is one of the things that come back that where you're talking about Artemisia's, the, the dodgy attributions, but some of those are members of the workshop trying mm. to perhaps even acknowledged at the time as doing something that isn't quite a whole Artemisia, but they're kind of close-ish. Mm. And, you know, there, there are, so there are those people around, there are, um, you know, there's a, there's a whole sex industry, um, which includes some women at the sort of, you know, top end of it, who are also very prominent as writers. Again, a group of writers whose personal lives get made a lot of, people like Veronica Franco mm. or Tullia D'Aragona, where we talk a lot about the interplay between personal life and writing. Um, and I think, you know, that set of women writers who, I mean, I think to some extent, like the, um, like the visual artists, have somewhat dropped out of the canon of literature of this period. I mean, they're hugely important mm. and there are lots and lots of them. Probably there is a lot more um, women in this period who wrote than who made sort of big history paintings, for example, or even kind of major portraits just because it's easier to get into. You don't need the apprenticeship in quite the same way. You can be taught to write by a courtier um, who, who's literate. So, you know, by the 1550s, you have a situation where there are collections of women's writing being published in Venice, mm. and there are 50 women to fill a book, which that's to me was quite, you know, I mean, this is quite astonishing stuff. And again, it's stuff that's been around in academic circles for a time, but it, it you know, it doesn't get out there in a popular perception of who are the important writers of the 16th century that's all your Cellini and Ariosto mm. and Aretino and then the sort of Machiavelli Guicciardini the historians right they're, they're all men mm. and you know people like Lisa Cabaritcher have done wonderful work sort of pulling together out of the um, contemporary collections source books of women women's writing which is which are marvelous now to have for teaching um, but it it's taken an awful lot of work by 
an awful lot of scholars um, to, to pull together that range of evidence for just how many women were active in the, the literary world. And I think what you say, Catherine, about linking up the dots is so important because obviously, you know, scholars and academics who've worked on sort of literary figures haven't necessarily, I mean, they've looked at art, but the art historians haven't necessarily looked across. And I think, I think in relation to Artemisia, Mary Garrard, who wrote the great book on Artemisia in 1989, has recently published, last year, published a book actually contextualizing Artemisia, um, it, it, you know, alongside her, feminist writers, particularly in Venice, because as you say, there's a real tradition of writers in Venice, and Artemisia goes to Venice for a couple of years, and a lot of work's been done on why she went there, why she left, um, you know, and and also in, in Florence, you know, Francesca Caccini, um, the daughter, of, you know, of the sort of the man who invented Italian opera, is working in the Medici court, and we know that Artemisia performed there, and she must have, you know, become close to her, and the powerful Medici women you know, in the 1610s. So it's a, I think what's really interesting about your work, Catherine, and I wish you know, <laughs> volume two is going to be <laughs> the 17th century, no. Um, but uh, it is about joining these dots because, um, you know, I certainly don't have the depth of knowledge in any of these areas. That's not really my role, but, you know, I think it's a very important thing to see these artists in some sort of cultural context, not just artistic context. Yeah, I must say the, the connections you form, Catherine, are, are so impressive and interesting. And I think that arises from your, as you said in your introduction, your multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach and how, how you handle those approaches to, to bring together in a text that's really readable is, is, in, is incredibly impressive. Um, and and Barney wanted to me ask um, how the value which I think you've answered of considering different approaches concurrently informing a coherent picture of a particular period but do you ever see any links or conflicts between political unrest and artistic achievement during the period? I mean I think it's just it's really hard to you know divorce the two because effectively mm. you have I mean a group of people a group of artists who are working in um you know, in, in a conflict environment and then in a post-conflict environment. I mean, okay, the, the major land wars in Italy last between 1494 and around about 15, 1529, 1530 or so. And then there are smaller ones later on. But everybody, you know, every military commander who is commissioning a portrait, um, you know, is paying for that through contracts for providing mm. military services. You know, these things are very intimately, they're linked up mm. I mean, some of, a lot of the Spanish money is now coming in through, um, you know, significant percentage of it coming in thanks to conquests um, in the Americas. You know, that, that, that's an income stream for all those Spanish, all that Spanish nobility mm. in Naples. The mm. percentage of their money comes from the Spanish Empire. Now, you know, it's, it's very, becomes very, very hard to untangle how all this plays out, how it plays out in the mind of any individuals. Of course, you have people like, and um, you go back to Leonardo da Vinci writing about, you know, how to draw a battle. And you do wonder, you know, was he going and observing because observation is so much sort of part of his method. Mm. Um, you have um, people like Titian making work that very directly um, refers to incidents in the um in the wars for cyprus in the 50 around about in late 1560s 1570s um so there's one example that I, I give in the book which is a flaying of marcias which is um refers to a real life atrocity mm. in which a Asian commander was actually flayed okay so it's was a right. it. but it's a real like that you know there is a real 16th century point of reference for it. So there's a, there are an awful lot of things going on there. When you dig down a bit, you can see well in the particular context of which war was happening at the time, there is a way that this work might have been read by contemporaries that isn't just about the classical subject or about the historic battle that it's showing. It's about what's happening here and now in the moment of the commission. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I can't believe it's 10 to 7, the time has gone. I know you flipped out, but the, the time is zooming and I don't think um, the, the structure is going to allow us enough time for people's questions too. So I suppose, I've and thank you so much, You've I've, in those case studies, you've really, yeah, shown me how, and um, what I'm most interested in is how you find those gaps in the scholarship and open them up and present them to new publics. 
So I guess I wanted to ask both of you, whether it's the reader or the exhibition visitor, how you think that they might be at their starting point when they come to the book and how you hope or the exhibition, um, their understanding of, of Baroque or Renaissance and how you think they might um, have altered those opinions. Obviously you can't talk for every person, it's a very difficult question, but how you hope that they would, um, or what you hope they would have taken away from the book or the exhibition in just a very, <laughs> very tight, concise way. <laughs> um, and their understanding, shifting the understandings of these massive terms like Renaissance and Baroque, which is so kind of thorny and require unpicking. Maybe Catherine. I suppose, first. Well, I, I suppose what I would like is for anybody who reads the book to be able to understand the, the some of the individual works of art and works of literature that are mentioned in the world in which they existed, and to see a little bit more about how how these different things are connected. Mm. I think I want to want to. I think the, the way I put this to when I was first pitching the book was I said like we know a lot of. Um, individual stars from the Renaissance and the reader might turn up knowing some of those individual stars how can we kind of arrange them into the constellations that they actually existed in mm, that's a really so beautiful that, way, that, that, way, was way that, was my, that was my sales pitch anyway they they, they liked it so they I'm also they, <laughs> well not surprised highly effective Letizia do you have a sort of similar uh, response to that um, I mean I think uh, I think for me, the exhibition is a sort of culmination. It's it, it's funny because if, as, a, as a visitor, it, that's all you see. But for me, it was sort of the culmination of a kind of four step process, which started with the acquisition. Then there was the conservation of the object, which we streamed online in almost real time in a series mm. of short films. And for me, that was, I have to be honest, it was equally important than the end result of an exhibition. Um, and and then also we did this tour of the picture around the UK, it went to a women's prison and went to a school and to a GP practice. And I was shaping the narrative of the exhibition in my mind during that entire period. And, you know, it seemed to me the thing that for me was 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 sort of most clear was the first the enthusiasm, you know, the Artemisia sort of aroused in people mm. and people who had no sort of art historical knowledge. So it was clearly the story of her life that really engaged people, but also the story of just how challenging it was for women in the 17th century, you know, to become painters. Um, and that became very clear in my mind. That was something that really had to come out of the exhibition to a general audience. Um, and, and, you know, yes, the exhibition was a sort of combination and of course the catalog that goes with mm. it. Actually, let's be honest, very few people in the end saw the exhibition. We were mm. only open six weeks out of 14 week run and on and off. So that's mm. very depressing, but, uh, but the catalog remains and I feel, I'm very proud of the catalog. I think there's lots of really interesting contributions from different scholars. Um, and, you know, and ultimately, I mean, I showed that picture of the picture of the painting hanging in the Italian Baroque gallery, because for me, it's about that. That yeah. picture is now forever in the National Gallery for future generations to enjoy. Um, the exhibition will be forgotten eventually. And, um, you know, that I feel we've, we've done our job in re-establishing her and a newly found painting, um, you know, in the context of the Italian Baroque now. And do you think inserting that picture into the main galleries next to the Caravaggio has um, disrupted people's understanding of the Baroque or those galleries or that hang or modified or? No, I don't think it not. has. But for me, you know, Artemis had been on our wish list for a very long time. Mm. But actually, we were very lucky. We were able to buy our first painting by Orazio Gentileschi as well within a year of, of our Artemisia. For me, it's about a fuller story. It's about the kind of the, the, the more extended narrative. Mm, yeah. Now we have this kind of nuancing. We have a picture by father and daughter. We have a self-portrait by Artemisia, which I think is very important for an artist that used her own image a lot that, you know, and what the story is in a way, the alternative narratives you can tell around just our picture. You know, the fact that women had to paint themselves because they weren't part of academies. You know, I mean, you can take mm. part of in so many different directions. So for me, the picture does a great deal more than what it did in the exhibition. You know, it does a lot for our, our, our collection as a whole. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, we now have, we have five minutes for questions. Um, and we can, uh, so I'd like to invite the online audience, um, you know, they're, you're very welcome to pick out um, points from either of the presentations and send them in through the chat function. 
Um, so please do that. We just have a very um, <laughs> easy factual question for Letizia so far, which is, um, have the letters been published? They have. They've been published in Italian, not translated, um, in, in 2011, shortly after they were discovered. Right. That uh, Francesco Solinas is actually working on a second edition with kind of augmented archival research, and he does hope that they will be properly translated into English. Uh, his book was due to come out in 2020. It hasn't come out yet. I think COVID hit. So. Okay, <laughs> sure. that's good to know. So I hope that answers your question and um, will allow other people to sort of follow her words and, and reconstruct the, the personality themselves. Um, so you're welcome audience to send in some questions. I was just thinking about, you both talked about the marketing of your, the exhibition and of your book and how far um, the marketing, and again, do you feel that, that sense of the, the pressure of marketing dictates the sort of narrative you want to tell or how do you balance that and, and talk to those marketing departments who want to sort of sensationalize in a way? Maybe Catherine first and then Letizia. Well, I mean, I have to say, I, I, I have a, a very good relationship with my publisher in terms of, um, you know, what goes into the body of the book. And really, I have, you know, within the boundaries of my agent advising, there are certain things that are likely or unlikely to sell in mm -hmm. a given market. Um, so some things get kind of ruled out early on as being too niche or not having enough name recognition. I mean, I think there is a difficulty with selling. You, you, you know, I could imagine it might be quite difficult to sell a biography of the Farnese family. For example, fascinating though they are because they just don't have um, that international name recognition that the Medici do. Mm. So there are, things, there are considerations like that that almost rule things out before you start. Um, although, and um, you know, maybe you know, some, at some point in the future it will be possible to do it and you just have to accept you do it for a smaller amount of money and that's fine. It can be like, you know, more of an academic book. Um, but yeah, but then when, where the marketing really comes in, I think is in, the, is in the cover and the title because that has to be something when a random person is walking through the front of that bookshop and they see it on the table, mm. are they going to pick it up and buy it as a present? And that's mm. one of the sort of defining things. I mean, it's, immediate, it's the very attention grabbing cover and marvelous. And um, Stephen in the design department did this wonderful job with that um, Titian, um, Cain and Abel on, on that cover with the letters sort of weaving around it, which I absolutely love. Um, but it's a, that's again, it's a real team effort to convince people that mm. it's actually something that is going to strike their eye, that, that, that you know, that they want to pick up. Um, so there are quite a lot of pressures there. And I think, you know, it's something that, yeah, you have to be conscious of as a writer, writing for general audiences that the market pushes in certain directions and you can push back up to a point, but you can't completely pitch something that nobody is convinced about putting in their bookshop. Quite different with with exhibitions so the curator is quite involved in those discussions with marketing and with design mm. we have in outside and outside designers um, but of course if posters can go up on the tube there are issues with over nudity and violence and it's quite hard to find an artemis <laughs> without a naked woman or without a bleeding sword i can tell you um, and um so that's one thing it ruled out honestly it ruled out most of the pictures um, <laughs> Also, as the narrative was developing and I had this very strong sense I wanted her to come forward, we made this very bold decision just to go with her first name, actually, and not use any strap line, not use a colon and a mm. second, you know. And it, it was obvious that we needed to use her face and actually a really zoomed in image of her face from the Hartford self-portrait where she's got a little earring. And so you kind of take away the costume. It's very kind of modern. You just have this face staring mm. at you and just says Artemisia very boldly. And it... And the whole look of it was very un-National Gallery. It was not traditional at all. Um, and I got so many questions. Why do you just use her name? Is it because she's a woman? It's so, you know, mm. you're, you're sort of putting her down. And I was like, no, Michelangelo, Tisha. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of artists we use single names, but it was really because also I wanted the kind of impact of her name with her face. I felt in a, in a way synthesized what I wanted in this show, which was to bring her pictures and her personality to the fore. 
Um, and I, yeah, absolutely do, has done that. Um, there, there is, I think we have a few minutes for um, any further questions. Um, so if anyone wants to type one in, they'd be more than welcome. Um, but I would um, kind of ask you about your future projects, having cracked open these big subjects and big people, where, where, where is your research leading you next? And will it emerge from, from these projects, um, Catherine? Well, I, I have two research projects that are really running in parallel. One mm -hmm. comes um, quite definitely out of this book, and it's a more focused project on the early history of firearms. Right. So I am looking in detail into the archives, working through lots of archive material that I have about the arms industry in 16th century Italy. Um, Beretta, for example, that's one of the famous names that you don't know belongs in this period, but they were founded in 1526. Hmm. So that has a 500th anniversary coming up in five years time. And so maybe there will be something for that. And alongside that, I have um, a quite different project that brings me back to some older work that I did about sort of people traveling to Rome and Anglo-Roman relations and I'm writing a book um, which is under contract called Roads to Rome 2000 years of travel along the routes of empire right. and this is people traveling to Rome on Roman and on Roman roads and um, and that all being well and it does require me doing some travel so there's a big caveat with this we'll be out in 2024 so another few years yet but um, it's enormous fun. I'm really enjoying getting back to a Rome project after a while, but I haven't done lots and lots of Rome work. Well, I hope it brings you back to the BSR specifically. Yes, to do that research. <laughs> and more generally. And Letizia. For me, it's rather Monty Python-esque, you know, now for something completely different because really our projects are driven by the kind of exhibition program um, mainly and uh so so i have an exhibition opening in july on bernardo bellotto who's mm -hmm. Canaletto's nephew um in 2017 we we purchased this amazing view of the fortress of Königstein, um, a fortress just outside dresden and he painted five views of this fortress that were all in england actually in bellotto's lifetime and i'm reuniting the five pictures for the first time in 250 years um so i was working on that book in lockdown last summer. So before we, our Tunisia had even happened, my head was already on Pilato. <laughs> um, it's just the way it is. Uh, and then um, I'm actually looking forward to trying to make headway on, on cataloguing the Italian mm -hmm. Baroque paintings. Um, the, the, there's a very out of date um, catalog from the 1970s and three, three curators before me have attempted. So <laughs> I'm gonna try and give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> well, brilliant really love with that project. I can't wait to read it and to find out your new research and actually to think about how, how you'll present that knowledge and new research to your public. And obviously, a National Gallery catalogue is a different type of readership, but you'll be asking those bigger questions and some of the things that we've addressed this evening. I know that um, Bryony wanted me to pass back to her as she has a few words to say about the London event. So I will say thank you so much to our speakers. Catherine, I'm sorry about your internet. Um, and I hope it didn't disrupt the conversation too much, but um, I think you have a lot to say to one another and I feel we needed more time to unpick mm. things, but it was an excellent introduction. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and passion. It's, it's brilliant. Lucky audiences, whether they're gallery visitors or um, readers. But Bryony, I, I will pass you over and say thank you very thank much you. and I'll give you a big warm round of applause. Thank you so much, Harriet, and thank you to Catherine and Letizia for such a fascinating discussion. And thank you to everybody for bearing with us through that slight technical issue. As Harriet said, I just wanted to mention our next event in the UK event series, which will be held on Tuesday, the 18th of May. It's uh, another new uh, strand that we're launching, which sees UK museum directors come together to discuss burning issues facing the museum world and its audiences in the 21st century. So for our event on the 18th of May, we're delighted to be welcoming Luke Sison, who is the director of the Fitzwilliam in Cambridge and is also a member of uh, BSR Council, alongside Nicholas Cullinan, who is the director of the uh, National Portrait Gallery in London and is, uh, is an alumnus of the BSR and they will be interviewed by Nicola Kalinsky, who is the director of the Barber Institute of Fine Arts in Birmingham. So that event is available to book on our website now, so please do uh, check that out. Um, later on this week, we will send you a feedback form 
Um, we were saying before that everybody's a bit sick of rece receiving feedback forms, but we'll be very grateful to hear any uh, thoughts you have on what you would like to see from the BSR UK events programme. We'll try and bring that to you if we can. There's also an opportunity to sign up as a member or make a donation to the BSR. So thank you in advance for any, for, I know how supportive the audience of the BSR is. So thank you so much for all of your ongoing support of the very important work that takes place there. Um, so thank you once again for joining us and I hope very much to see you at a future BSR UK event. So goodbye from the BSR and goodbye from our speakers this evening. <laughs>